department. That was a lot of fun. I got to do some really cool things at SeaWorld. Uh, I got to bottle feed a baby manatee and uh, watch a shark get a physical exam. And I saw a number of, of dolphins and a killer whale being born. And so really loved my, that was a year I worked at SeaWorld. And uh, I decided to make science, you know, biology my major, my career. I wanted to do marine biology specifically. Mm -hmm. Not to end up back at SeaWorld, but I thought I would love research. You know, I wanted to be out. I used to tell people, I want to be out on a boat in the middle of nowhere just studying something. Right, that's <laughs> not really uh, a possible, but anyway. Um, so I wanted to do marine biology. I, my first year of college, I stayed in Florida. Like I said, I'm doing an uh, intro. I'm from Florida. I stayed there my first year. I went to Southern in Tennessee my second year. And really enjoyed my time there at Southern. I wish I could have stayed longer, but that's where I met my husband. And he graduated. I was a sophomore, he was a senior. So he graduated, and I, I didn't want to be, yeah, I got it Didn't want to be uh, on one, he was going to go out to California for medical school. And so to be separated, you know, 3,000 miles did not sound fun to me. So I transferred out to La Sierra University, which is close to Loma Linda. They're about 20 minutes, 30 minutes apart. And so I finished up my last two years of undergraduate work there at La Sierra so that I could be close to Jason. Uh, I quickly realized that things at La Sierra were a bit different than Southern and, and the Florida schools that I had been to. Um, they, there were really teaching evolution, but the, the professors believed it themselves, which makes a totally difference, big difference. When a teacher is teaching you evolution, but they don't believe it, they're just showing you, you know, this is what's out there, as opposed to them actually trying to convince you to believe like them, it makes a big difference. And so I was confronted with this, and I wasn't quite converted at the time either, I was just starting to get closer to God. Through high school and my first couple years of college, I was you know, quite out there as a, an Adventist, very, very secular. So I was just coming back closer to God, and then I'm confronted with these issues of evolution at La Sierra, and um, so I really had to struggle with them. All right, let me do some uh, definitions for you here. So a young earth creationist, a okay, young earth creationist, basically believes that the heavens, the earth, and all the life on earth were created um, at, as direct acts of God in a relatively short period, basically that creation week, okay, everything was created in a week, and it was about 5,700 to 10,000 years ago, and that's using the chronologies of, you know, Adam lived, you know, 300 years, and we got so and so, and then lived another 600, and then he died. Okay, so using those chronologies, we can go back and come to about the 6,000 years that this earth has been around. Okay, or the, since creation. Okay, this is Christians and Jews that are going to take the Bible literally. They believe in creation. The days of creation are 24 hour literal days. There's a slight variation of this called the young life creationists. And this is where I would fall into young life creations. Okay, I'm still taking those days of creation as 24 hour literal days. Um, but, okay, and believe that all life, okay, so all the plants, all the animals, everything living on this planet was created during, created during those, that creation week. Um, however, the portions of the universe that I believe in it's okay if you don't, I'm just putting this out there, that not everything in the whole universe was created during that creation week, during those seven days of creation. Um, so then, there could be other planets and galaxies or whatever that were created at some other time. You know, I mean, how long has God been around? Forever, right? God's been around forever. Okay, so he, he probably did lots of other creating. I mean, we know that there's other worlds out there, right? Yes. We can get an idea from the book of Job. Job. Uh -huh, exactly. So, someone, who has their Bibles this afternoon? Someone read Genesis 1. 1 and 2 for us. I'll wait for you to get it. 
by the way, I didn't even say this, but Los Angeles is in Southern California. Um, and uh, you notice I put YUC up there. That's Young Earth Creationists. Okay, young Life Creationists could fall into that category as well. They actually would call them, or call us, yet. I felt it was very derogatory for a professor to say, oh, those yeks, you know. <laughs> Doesn't it just sound rude to call somebody a yek? Yeah, I thought so too. So anyway, it was just this d demeaning atmosphere there, and like, trying to push you down and get the, your, you to believe like them. Because um, the chair of the department, he went on, after going through Adventist education, went and got his um, doctorate degree and felt like he was just, unprepared, he was slammed with evolution and he just felt so stupid that he had to change his mind. So he didn't want that same experience for his students. So he wanted to educate them and make them believe like he did before they went on to you know, dental school, medical school, graduate school. Okay, so evolution was discussed in a number of classes, mostly biology classes, but even religion classes, which was really quite sad. All the biology majors had to take a senior capstone course. Okay, it's called uh, issue, moral and social issues of biology. They are religious moral and social issues of biology. Basically, could have just been renamed to evolution. Okay, this class went you know, ten weeks for the quarters there, uh, just showing you know, evolution after evolution of every day. Uh, what they did to try to really bring the points home was they had group discussions. So they have the students get in these little groups and say, okay, now you choose as a group. We'll pre present these different theories like the ones I showed you, the Young Earth Creation and, and um, uh, Theistic Evolution. So you decide in your little group which, which you think is the most likely to have happened. And so students get together and start talking about it. And I was in one of these, these groups. This, I believe it was my junior year in college. And one girl was just really more outspoken than all the rest of us. And she was like, oh, yeah, I really think it's theistic evolution. I think you can, I think you can mix creation and evolution. And I didn't really, I didn't know much at the time. And I wasn't really that strong in my faith yet. I wasn't reading the Bible very much. And so I was like, hmm, well, yeah, I guess. Maybe she's right. So I just you know, let her say, yeah, as a group, we think theistic evolution could be true. And so, uh, so anyway, just like using groups where st students can influence each other and the professors, um, or they would, after they showed, you know, human, you know, hominid evolution from apes to, to humans, what they think is evolution from apes to humans, then they would make us get in groups and uh, pick what we thought was the most convincing piece of evidence. You know, and, just, and we'd have to sit there and say, hmm. You know, of this whole lecture, I thought this was the most convincing, and we'd have to share that with the class. I mean, it was just trying to ingrain evolution into us, and so I really just wish I had more of this information during that time, so I wouldn't have been uh, uh, so impressionable. Uh, we had to do t uh, papers and tests on evolution as well. And right about this time, when really I was almost thinking about going the other way, believing in evolution, um, my then boyfriend was, and I started reading this book called The Trip in the Supernatural. Have you guys heard of this book before? No. Trip in the Supernatural. Have you heard of Incredible Answers of Prayer by Roger Morneau? Oh, fantastic books. This, this guy, Roger Morneau, he actually was um, joining a satanic cult where they actually worship Satan. Okay, they worship Satan and the demons, and he was getting into this satanic worship. And like a week before he had to make his final decision if he was going to join the satanic cult, he starts um, Bible studying with some Adventists. And uh, really amazing book. I mean, things go flying around his house, and the demons you know, talk to him. I mean, just crazy stuff. But real. It's a true story. It's his testimony. And in this book, Roger Marneau makes some really interesting statements about evolution that he heard the Satan's priest say. Now here's some of the assertions made by Roger Morneau in this book. Uh, he says that Satan personally tutored Charles Darwin. Okay, you guys know Charles Darwin, right? He uh, came up with it. He, he wrote on the origin of species, which is the main document for evolution. And by the way, do you know when Charles Darwin came up with that book on the origin of species? What year? What? It, it was, it, he published it in like 1850-something, but he, he actually finished the manuscript in 1844. So right when God was raising up a movement to proclaim his, his Sabbath and his creation and his end-time message, Satan was raising up a movement that was going to try to tear all that. 
Darwin finished his uh, On the Origin of Species manuscript. Okay, so Singh was personally tutored Darwin, and he did this through the medium of hypnotism. Okay, Darwin as a child was hypnotized. I don't remember why, some health problem or something, I would assume. But he was hypnotized as a child, and that gave Satan an inroads into his mind. So Satan personally tutored Darwin and helped him come up with this theory of evolution. Uh, evolution is a religion. Okay, and you've seen that, you know, the people that believe in evolution, I mean, they're so staunch about it, it's really like a religion more than a science. And we'll see that later, too. It takes a lot of faith to believe in evolution. So evolution is a religion. And um, this, I actually differ on. There's a good friend of mine named Sean Pittman. He has a website that I'll be showing you later. It's called detectingdesign.com. He, and I've gotten a lot of my stuff from him, he, he just does fantastic work on um, looking for the evidences, evidences of creation. He reads just crazy amounts of literature trying to come up with um, good arguments for our faith and things that go against evolution. He doesn't think that believing in evolution is really a salvational issue. Okay, he just thinks, I don't know, it, it's, it's not God's ideal. But to me, if you stop and think about it, when you believe in evolution, I mean, you're really discounting God. You're discounting His creative power. You're discounting the, the Bible. How can you believe in the Bible if you don't believe in the first two chapters? Yeah, the first one chapter. Okay. So anyway, in, that, in the book, Roger Morneau does say that believing in evolution um, can very easily discount or disqualify someone from being in the kingdom of God. So it's not something that we should take lightly. Okay? They can be, maybe not for everyone. You know, too much, whoever much is given, much is required, right? So, but to those that know better, I believe that believing in evolution really can be a salvation issue. So then, because of this, because it's such an important thing, it can even cost people their salvation. Thank you. Um, read this, you guys. This is amazing. So it says here that Satan considers the teachers of the theory of evolution to be so valuable to him that in the sight of all the inhabitants of the galaxies, he assigns a retinue, or basically a, a group. He assigns a group of bright, beautiful angels to follow that educator all the remainder of his life. And it goes on to say that is the highest honor that, that Satan can give to anyone on this planet. Okay, so the people that are teaching evolution, Satan blesses them, if you will, with his, the highest honor that he can give to individuals by sending angels, your dark, demonic angels, to follow that person and help them to try to deceive people their whole lives. Okay, is this a serious issue? Yeah, yeah it is. I mean, demons are helping individuals teach the theory of evolution. So I read this just in time. Okay, so that junior year of, of college, I read this book, I read these passages, that made a huge impact in my life. And I decided to stand firm for God's creation. I started, you know, asking questions to my teachers instead of just letting them say whatever they wanted. And it was truly a blessing in my life. So I would suggest, I don't know if you can get a copy of that book, but uh, Trip to the Supernatural is an excellent book. Alright, so now I want to go into a little bit of the theological implications. So looking at scripture, uh, looking at some, some ways people try to mix creation and evolution. And why does it really matter? Why can't someone be both a Christian and an evolutionist? Or as uh, Clifford Goldstein, you know, Clifford Goldstein, who's the editor of our Sound School Quarterly, he wrote an article a few years back called Seventh Day Darwinians. Uh -huh. you know, can you be a Seventh Day Darwinian? Okay, so there's a number of theories that people have come up with to try to mix creation and evolution. One of them is the gap theory, and another is the day-age theory. Here's an example of the gap theory. Okay, it says here in Genesis 1, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then period, and then maybe a billion years later, maybe billions of years later, then verse 2 happens. Where the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. So this gap theory basically says that there's multiple creations. So there was a creation here in Genesis 1:1, and you know that's where you know, the dinosaurs and, and amoebas, trilobites, and all. 
all those things uh, are found in our fossil record. That was from this creation here. And then there were billions of years, and then later God did a second creation that we came about from. And that's the gap theory. That just sounds ridiculous, right? Yeah. Hey, I, I, there's no reason to believe that there are billions of years in between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Okay, um, the second one, the day-age theory. And this one is actually kind of common because, you know, in, um, Peter writes that a day to the Lord is like a thousand years. Have you read that before? Yeah. Okay, a day to the Lord is like a thousand years. Well then. Some people have said, well, maybe each day of creation can equal a million years. Maybe day one was a million years, and day two was another million years, and three, and four, and five, and six, so that you get millions of years, and it's still you know, the creation story. Okay, well, I'm going to show you why that cannot be true. All right, and this is going to be kind of technical if you don't remember it all. Uh, if you are a biology major, you should probably know this. But if not, the take-home message I want you to remember is this. Okay, I've got it up here right now. The order is different. So the order in those six days of creation and the order that evolution proposes is different. You cannot take each day and blow it up into a few million years. Okay? So what's the take-home message here? The order is different. Okay, let me show you this specific now. All right, here's what creation teaches. So creation, on, uh, one through four, we're not going to deal with. But uh, day number five, I don't remember what God created on day number five. Okay, birds and fish, or sea creatures. Let's just lump them together. Good. So the birds, the things that are in the air, and the things that are in the waters, the sea creatures, the fish. Um, I included here whales, and in the King James Version it does specifically say whales, but even if it doesn't, it says sea creatures, obviously whales would be included in that, right? And anyone want to disagree with me that, that whales would be on a different day of creation? I don't know. They're sea creatures. Okay? Uh, the other thing is, so you biology majors out here, uh, are whales fish? They're mammals. Good. Okay, they're air breathing like we are, they have live birds, they are mammals. Alright, and then the birds. What about day number six? What was created on the sixth day of creation? <laughs> land animals. Good. The land animals, I put on there specifically reptiles because that will be important. Uh, so, your snakes and alligators, and, yeah, lizards, all the reptiles. I believe we were created on day number six as a land mammal. So your your cows and tigers and, and the dogs and cats and all the land mammals. That would include human okay, beings too. I don't know if you stop and thought about that. But uh, we were created on the same day as the animals. Does that make you feel bad? <laughs> you were created the same day as a pig? <laughs> but what's the difference? We are created in the image of God. We were created in the image of God. Does that make a big difference? Yes. 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 It makes a huge difference. We created in the image of God. And then because of that, He then gave us dominion over the planet. We're supposed to take care of it. Uh, okay, so that's a side note. But anyway, so day number six, the land mammals, other land animals too. Your creepy things, all your insects. Um, those were created on day number six as well. So land animals, I put there because this will be important, the reptiles and the land animals. Now, let's see what evolution teaches, and you tell me if the order is the same or if it's different. Alright, so evolution teaches that life began in the ocean. Life began in the ocean somehow, and this they, they can't explain how they got the first cell. And abiogenesis, getting life from non-life, is so unscientific. I mean, no one... If it didn't have these, you know, consequences of believing in God, there would be no scientists that believe, believe that life could come from non-life. But somehow or another, that first cell developed in the ocean. 
And eventually, sometimes that cell stuck to other cells and became more complex. And eventually, we had got the fish. Okay, so we get the fish. Then, through a few million years more of this descent with modification, the fish changing over time, they would eventually get to the amphibians. What are amphibians? Okay, frogs, salamanders, good. Exactly, so the amphibians would be next. Then the amphibians decided, hey, I like, I like land and I'm going to you know, have scales and become the reptiles. Okay, so fish to amphibians to reptiles. Then something very interesting happened with the reptiles again in evolutionary theory. Um, you guys know when they say that dinosaurs, like the T-Rex, became? Birds, yes. Uh -huh. Birds. So the T-Rex, uh, little hands, I think eventually became wings. Alright, so the reptiles, some, one group of reptiles, eventually through lots of changes, became the birds. Then there was a different group of reptiles that stayed more on the land, decided to grow some fur, and became the mammals. Alright? So reptiles, one group became the birds, another group became the mammals, and then obviously a group stayed as reptiles, didn't change at all. Ooh, that was scary. Alright, then, and this is where it gets even funnier, um, then there was this one land mammal that was kind of deer-like. A deer like land mammal that decided to spend a little more time by the water, it's like the ocean, and over millions of years, like the ocean more and more, and stayed there, grew some fins, and became the whales. Okay, so, and that's how I got mammals, the whales, into the ocean. So, if you tell me in the evolutionary time scale, are birds and whales very old creatures or more recent creatures? More recent, see how they're at the, at the end? The older ones would be the fish, you know, the sharks, those sorts of things. Um, so evolution teaches that birds and whales are highly evolved, they're very recent creatures. But, you can see that the order is different. So God says, I can create whales and birds first. Then, later, he creates the reptiles and the land mammals. Where evolution says, no, 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 no. You have to have the reptiles and the land mammals first. Then, a few million years later, you're going to get to the birds and the whales. You guys see that? So can you take day, day number five and expand it into a few million, million years to fit with evolutionary theory? No, you can't. Okay, because these would have to come first. If this had been day number four, that was day number five, then you might be able to do that. Obviously, you still would have an issue with believing God in his word. But you can't. You cannot take the days of creation and expand them into millions of years because it doesn't even fit. You're trying to fit with a theory that's totally different. The order is totally different. Okay, so when someone comes up to you and says, oh, each, each day of creation, that could be long ages of time. What are you going to tell them? The order is different. Yes, you cannot do that because the order is different. It doesn't fit. 
closest to him. Okay, so, yeah, that's all. Basically, believing in evolution, you have to become a cultural Adventist, right? You're an Adventist by culture, not really by belief anymore. Okay, so you have to throw out the Sabbath if you throw out the story of creation. This one, I couldn't find the exact text, or a uh, quote, I'm sorry, but there is um, there's a, a Old Testament scholar. I thought it was Cambridge, it might be Oxford, but one of those, those um, universities over in England. Um, okay, anyway, so this, this um, Old Testament scholar says, uh, because a number of individuals will say, oh, the story of creation isn't meant to be taken literally. It was just God kind of letting us know he created. But not, not to say exactly how it was done. It's just God you know, giving us a nice story. But it's not meant to be taken literally. Well, this, this scholar, this Hebrew scholar, says that when you read Moses, when you read the story of Genesis, there is not a scholar, he, he doesn't think there's a scholar, a serious scholar on the planet that believes that Moses meant for it to be taken allegorically or as stories. He said there's no serious scholar that would say Moses did not believe that it was seven literal days. Okay? So looking at how he wrote it, you know, the evening and the morning or the first day, there's no one that believes that Moses himself did not believe that those were literal days. Now, that same scholar would say, but he was wrong. He would say Moses was wrong and it wasn't seven literal days. So I think that's actually really interesting. So this evolutionist Hebrew scholar says, oh yeah, Moses meant for it to be seven days, but he was wrong. I don't believe it. Yeah, which I think is really interesting because he's being honest. He's saying Moses believed it was seven literal days. And to me, if Moses meant for it to be that way, that's the way that we should read it, right? Yeah. So you can't say, oh, the, the Bible writers meant for it to be taken in stories. They never meant for it to be taken scientifically. That's, that's not true. Moses meant for it to be, and God meant for it through Moses to be seven days. All right, what other theological implications? to believe me in evolution. Well, what you do with sin? Evolution negates or crosses out sin. This is my favorite one. Someone look this up for us. Okay, Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 12. So your Bible's handy. Romans 5, verse 12. So if you can only remember one scripture that goes against evolution besides you know, the creation story, this is the one that I would go to. Romans 5, verse 12. And someone else, maybe closer to the back. Do you have it back there? Yes? Okay, nice and loud. Can you read Romans 5, 12 for us? Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just the as they enter the world, through one man, and that we seek, and in this way, that we all men become all sin. Okay, so it said, what entered the world? Sin. sin. Through how many men? One. one. Who's that one man? Adam. So sin came into the world because of one man, Adam. And then what became, what also came with sin? Death. Okay, death came because of sin. Now if evolution were true, how many animals would have had to die during those millions and billions of years? Okay, billions and billions of them. Right? Every generation there had to be death upon death upon death, the survival of the fittest and natural selection, creating, not creating, but um, having new species arise. So if death was a natural process that God used to create and finally get to humans, then you know, it, it doesn't fit with this. That death came because of sin. So the Bible says clearly there that sin came because of Adam and death came because of Adam. There was nothing that died before Adam sinned. Is that clear? Nothing died before Adam sinned. Okay, so as I just said, evolution requires death. Lots and lots of death in order to get new species. So then, what if death came before sin? Well, that would go against what Romans 6.23 tells us. What is Romans 6.23? You guys probably have that one memorized, right? Rebellion 
and evolution. Obviously, there's many more to this list than my other list, but I just chose a few. Uh, Richard Dawkins, have you heard of him? Richard Dawkins, he's like probably the biggest evolutionist on the planet right now. He's an um, Englishman. And um, he thinks he thinks theistic evolution is just garbage. You know, and he says if you believe in evolution, you absolutely have to throw out God. There's no room for God in evolution. Um, and he's also, it, it really comes down to morality. You know, atheists, they don't want to be morally bound to a god. Okay, and uh, so Richard Dawkins, you know, he's on his third wife and so forth and so on. So, um, Adolf Hitler, okay, Hitler with his idea of um, eugenics, trying to get this pure race. It's really just evolution. I mean, it's survival of the fittest. He was trying to knock off the um, the invalids, kind of the the more mentally slow, the handicapped individuals. He didn't want any of them to breed, so he killed them so that he could have a more superior race of people. Uh, the Catholic Church, interestingly enough, is okay with evolution. Uh, here, just in 2009, on the 150-year anniversary of Darwin's book on the origin of species, um, they held a five-day five conference at this university and basically confirmed the lack of conflict between evolutionary theory and the Catholic theology and the rejection of intelligent design by Catholic scholars. So that's pretty sad, huh? A church rejecting intelligent design and accepting evolutionary theory, saying there's no problem, you can mix, mix the two and still be a Christian. Desmond Ford, have you guys heard of Desmond Ford? Okay, this was a problem in our church back in the 80s. Um, he was a, a, an Adventist professor at PUC, Pacific Union College in uh, Northern California, and he rejected the sanctuary doctrine. So he said, there is no heavenly sanctuary. Jesus is not our mediator in heaven. He did everything at the cross. He threw out Ellen White, who wasn't reading her anymore. And it caused a big deal in our church. There was a lot of individuals that believed his way and uh, were asked to leave the church. My father was actually one of them. Uh, so I just recently found out, though, that Desmond Ford is an evolutionist. So he, you know, when you throw out the sanctuary, when you throw out Ellen White, you throw out the protection that God has given us, you're going to end up in these weird theories that he has. He, um, he believes in evolution now. And I, uh, I put a quote on here. You've probably heard this one before. It's from um, Councils to the Church. Ellen White says that... Um, the gifts are next question. So after there's like jealousy in the church, the gifts, the, the gifts that God has given us, specifically the testimonies that he's given us, are questioned. Then, of course, they have but little weight. And instruction given through the vision is disregarded. Next follows skepticism in regard to the vital points of our faith. The pillars of our position then doubt Sorry, then doubt as to the Holy Scriptures, and then the downward march to perdition. So when you throw out the testimonies that God has given us, then you start questioning the, the pillars of our faith. Then you start questioning the Scriptures themselves, and it's just a downward spiral into perdition, which is a nice way to say hell. Um, when the testimonies which were once believed are doubted and given up, Satan knows the deceived ones will not stop at this. And the, uh, he redoubles his efforts till he launches them into open rebellion. So when Satan sees us 